All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Elrod, and I am on the Community Platform Engineering team at Red Hat. I work uh, primarily with the Fedora infrastructure, and uh, my latest project has been AAA, uh, authentication, authorization, and accounting or auditing. Some people use a different final A there. Um, but yeah, so I want to talk about uh, how we do AAA currently and uh, some ideas we have and are currently exploring for uh, doing things differently going forward. So a couple of statistics uh, just about the Fedora infrastructure. Um, in the database right now for our current account system, we have uh, 60,000 accounts that are labeled active. Um, in practice, probably about half of those are actively used. Um, we have around 500, give or take, servers. This is including VMs, builders, uh, vert hosts, cloud instances, uh, all over the place. Um, these are scattered across mul a multitude of data centers. Uh, we, have, we have space uh, in some donated uh, racks. Uh, we have some cloud instances that we use uh, throughout different regions. Uh, we have two primary data centers. One is in Phoenix, and then one is on the East Coast. Uh, we have over 30 web applications, um, and a lot of these tie into the auth system. So we have the wiki, we have uh, build front ends, um, you know, all, all sorts of various web applications that we use. And uh, this is our current account system, right? So if you have interacted with Fedora at all, you've seen a page like this. Um, this is what we've been using since around 2007. And um, this is the system that we're currently trying to move away from, and I'll explain why. Um, but first off, so what, what is FAST? What is the Fedora account system? What does it do? Uh, the primary thing it does is it allows for self-service user and group management. Um, so I guess to, to elaborate on that a little bit, um, a user who wants to join our community, they can go to the Fedora account system, they can sign up, they can look at groups, they can request to join a group, they can be sponsored into a group. Um, Without, without a fast administrator having to kind of handhold that process, it's, it's self-service. Um, the next thing it does is it's a custom authentication and authorization solution. So all of the code in fast is currently a custom solution. Um, it kind of leverages the Turbo Gears 1 authentication system. Uh, if you've used Turbo Gears at all, uh, it's a Turbo Gears Turbo Gears 1 is quite an old framework, which is one of the reasons we need to get off of it. Um, originally, it had a baked-in uh, OpenID provider, and then later that moved to a separate project called Ypsilon, uh, which we use primarily uh, for OpenID Connect nowadays. So there's a server component, and that is the, uh, the web application for the users to do self-service tasks. Uh, it also provides an API so that the client component that I'll talk about can call into it and do various things. And it tracks all this information. So it allows for auditing. When a user uh, joins a group, it'll, it'll track that. When a user changes their information, it'll track that, just so we can go back and see who did what when. Uh, it also allows for users to apply and be sponsored into various groups. And then the uh, client component, <coughs> Uh, again, there's an API that the, the server component provides. The client component will call into that API. Um, and the way that we use it in the infrastructure is that we run this on a cron every hour. And it will, it will call into the API. It will get the user information and group information. And it will write out uh, custom NSS database files with this information. It will put them into place. Uh, it will add the user's uh, public SSH keys to their home directory. So it kind of does all this manual work right now. Um, I mean, it's automated, but it's still, the process itself is a fairly manual process. <coughs> so why was Fast made originally? Well, one of the ideas, I, I wasn't around at the time, I, I joined the community later, one of the ideas that I heard is just LDAP is scary, right? So there, there weren't too many people working on this at the time that it was created originally. They were throwing around ideas, they were playing with LDAP, but ultimately LDAP was just scary. Um, there were some other issues alongside that, like again, our infrastructure is distributed, so um, being able to do replication and have things stay in sync, it was just really hard to do at that time. Um, things have gotten easier, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, but um, 
LDAP was just scary at the time, right? And I think there might have also been a little bit of not invented here syndrome, right? So writing code is fun. People wanted to write code, people wanted to play. Um, the other thing is there were, there were some custom use cases. There are things that Fast does that just weren't possible with other solutions at the time. Um, so certificate generation, some of the two-factor stuff that we kind of baked in later. Um, you know, some of the, just, just some of the various information that we store and what we do with it uh, just weren't possible with other solutions out of the box previously. Uh, so we we wrote fast too. There was a fast one before that. Again, this was before my time. I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, so we wrote fast too, and we've been using it since around 2007, 2008. Uh, over the time, there's been some problems that have come up with it. Um, one of them is that the server side component currently only runs on RHEL 6, and RHEL 6 is set to end of life in November of this year. So that's a problem. Uh, you know. Authentication is kind of important, and we want to run it on a supported platform. Um, again, the current FAST is all custom code. So if you know anything about security, encryption, authentication, the number one rule is you don't write it yourself. Like, you use things that have been tested. You use things that you know, are known to work. Uh, and all of, all of the authentication code in FAST is, is custom built. Not a good thing. Again, it's on Turbo Gears 1, which has been end of life for probably six years now. It's really old. And it's never had a true full security audit. So again, our entire infrastructure is depending on this platform. There have been security bugs, which I'll, I'll show a couple of them. Um, it's never had a full security audit. So as a result, there's been a number of security issues, a number of big security issues. Um, this one was kind of funny. So uh, I mentioned that we have a, a fast client that runs on the, the systems in our infrastructure. It will set the uh, SSH public key for each user in their home directory. It'll add it to authorized keys. So a user on an account could symlink their authorized keys file to any other file on the system. The client would write to that symlink and the file that it's linking to is what would get updated. Because the client is updating NSS databases and you know, it, it's, it, it needs to write to certain directories, it's running as root. As a result, any file on the system could be updated with whatever the user uploaded as their SSH key. That's a problem. Uh, this was one that I found uh, when I was kind of starting to get involved in this, uh, this was back in 2013. Uh, if, a, if a user had applied to a group but they hadn't been approved yet, that particular API endpoint wasn't sanitized. So even if they had privacy set on their account, all of their information was available publicly through the API if you, if you asked for uh, the JSON response from the API. Uh, this is one that, for those of you who know Patrick, this is one that he found a couple years ago at a uh, at Flock. Um, this is basically saying if you set uh, if you set the X client verify header to success, and you had uh, and you set uh, X client CN to a username, any validation that you are that user is completely gone out the window. You can spoof to be any user. That's a problem. These, all the way, by the way, all three of these have been fixed. So, sad and frustrating. So, uh, so requirements for a new system going forward, right? What do we need? We need something secure. We need something that has a good proven track record, something that's been used uh, in production by companies, other projects. We need something that's well supported, well maintained. And we still need that self-service component, right? We still want users to be able to, to change their own information. Um, we still want people to be able to sponsor people into groups. Um, you know, we want the community to be able to take control of their data rather than having admins do all this for them. So, choices. So our first attempt at fixing this was something called FAST3. This was uh, done in the 2012, 2013 era by uh, Xavier Lamian. 
And, well, uh, Linus Torvalds has a quote. It says, uh, subversion used to say CVS done right, and with that slogan, there's nowhere you can go. There's no way to do CVS right. Well, there's no way to do fast right. With, with the problems that I mentioned before, like, you can't get away from that. We want to do something completely different. So, choices. So, first thing we looked at was an idea that Patrick originally proposed to me. And uh, it was Amazon Cognito. And their slogan, if you go to their landing site, is simple and secure user sign up, sign in, and access control. And that's well and good, but it literally does that and nothing more. That's the one thing that it does. It follows the Unix philosophy. It does one thing and it does it well. Uh, so it doesn't really lend itself to community authentication. It doesn't lend itself to you know, having the custom fields that we need and, and storing all this extra metadata that we need to attach to a user. Um, it is extensible with AWS Lambda functions, but the net result is that we're going to be doing the same thing we're trying to get away from. We're going to be writing all this custom code, and you know, we're, we're still going to have to write most of the components ourselves. Uh, some other things, it, it lacked a couple of uh, API endpoints that we were going to need very heavily. And uh, so things like tell me all the users that are attached to a group, that was, uh, that, that, that API endpoint is locked down to admins only. Um, retrieving basic information about a, a user or a group, their, their metadata, the, the extra fields they have attached to them. And again, these are fixable. You can write AWS Lambda functions and do it. But these, these API endpoints were not out of the box on Cogino. Uh, it's not set up to provide SSH or system access. And again, there are ways around this. So we could have used more AWS Lambda functions. We could use uh, SSH certificates where you know, when, a, when a user wants to uh, SSH into a system, they, they use a custom SSH client. It tells them, go to this URL in your browser, authenticate against Cognito, and a SSH certificate will be generated for you, and you'll use that to get into the system. So it is possible to work around this in a mostly automated way, but it's not set up for that out of the box. Also, it's just not open source, and that's something that the community is quite vocal about. Um, so it's, it's worth noting. Uh, and some people within uh, AWS suggested you know, combining Cognito with another service, like free IPA or uh, something else that'll store extra metadata about the users that Cognito isn't set out to do out of the box. And, uh, and I, I talked with people, and we had considered this, but kind of the consensus was if we're going to be deploying something else anyway, let's just go all in on that solution. With the manpower that we have right now and the skill set that we have, if we're going to go with something else anyway alongside of Cognito, just go all in on the other solution. So, choices. So, then we looked at free IPA. And, spoiler, this is kind of what we ended up settling. Um, so why free IPA? Well, LDAP in general is less scary than it used to be. There's, there's a lot of documentation out there. Um, there are really good communities. The free IPA team themselves is, is very helpful. So it's, it's just, over time, it's gotten less scary. IPA is actively developed. It's actively maintained. It's act actively audited. It's used in production. It's a Red Hat product. It's well supported. There's companies using it. There's communities using it. So. Getting help maintaining it, getting help with deploying it is not really a problem. Like, there's people using it, and anything that we hit has either already been hit by someone who is using it, and they're usually willing to help, or there's enough information out there that we can work with it and, and figure out what's going on. Uh, the IPA team has been extremely responsive and supportive. They've really helped us. You know, we've had meetings with them internally, and. You know, they've just been extremely helpful and, and willing to, to do what it takes to, to help us get, get this deployed, uh, which, is, which is awesome. And there's an amazing API. So I, I don't know if any of you have ever used the, uh, the free IPA API, but there's endpoints for pretty much anything and everything you could want to do. Um, 
and it's just it's really awesome. It's very well documented. If you go into the, the web portal, um, you know, it gives you examples of all the arguments, what they take, what they do. It's, it's really cool. And it's entirely false. It's entirely open source. Uh, it's customizable. So for fields that we need that it doesn't currently have, we can write a, a simple LDAP schema extension to add them. And again, this is something the IPA team has helped us with extensively. Uh, there's built-in customization for access. So it has role-based access control out of the box. So you can say, you know, this user or this group or this set of systems can do this, uh, but not these other things. Like, it's very flexible, which is really cool. It works out of the box with Ypsilon and Keycloak. So our OpenID Connect and OpenID systems will still work. Our web apps will all work with it pretty much out of the box with a couple of configuration changes, um, which is another thing that's, it, it's useful, right? We use that everywhere. And replication works. So I said we, we have a kind of a distributed infrastructure. We have, uh, you know, six or seven different data centers that we have servers in. Replication works. It's well tested nowadays. Um, there's, again, there's companies and communities using replication, um, you know, yeah, it works. Uh, there are some downsides, right? So LDAP schema extensions, if you're not familiar with that language, can be hard to learn. And this is, again, something the IPA team has helped us with. Um, but if you, if you threw me at that, I would not have gotten it right the first time. So they, they, can, be, they can be challenging. Uh, but the other thing is those should be rare, right? So we have a, a set of fields that we need to add once, and then you know, adding more is generally not something we're going to have to do very often. Uh, it's not set up for self-service out of the box. And I'm going to talk about the, the portal project that we're working on to kind of fill in that gap. But free IPA itself, it's oftentimes it's deployed in kind of a corporate environment where you have one you know, set of global admins that will add users or remove users or disable users as needed as people come into the company or leave the company or need access. Um, it's not set up to be a self-service project out of the box. And when you're first setting it up, it can be, you know, there's a lot of new terminology. There's a lot of, um, a lot of things to consider when you're first setting it up. And in, if you haven't done that before, it can be a little bit complex. And again, because of that new terminology, it can be somewhat challenging to learn. So uh, internally, there's a, a really good course um, that, that employees of Red Hat can take and learn about it. If you're not internal and you're in the community, you know, how do we convey, you know, this is, this is our technology set. This is if you need to do something that you can't do from the portal that we're writing, this is how you do it. Um, you know, so that, that's something that we, we need to take into consideration. Um, yeah, it, it can be challenging to learn. So uh, for the self-service component, we're working on, on a user portal. Um, and a couple of goals, right? So we want it to do most of the things that the fast front end will let you do now. Um, so register for an account, change your information, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to do those things well and secure. So yeah, allow users to uh, register, modify their information, allow group sponsors to sponsor other people into groups uh, that they maintain. Look up information about users and groups. You know, is, is my friend in this group? Maybe I want to join that group too. Um, or show me information about this user, I want to see if they're cool and I want to be their friend, whatever. Uh, reset forgotten and expired passwords. And then a couple of non-goals, right? So account deletion. Uh, this is something that we, we, we handle in infrastructure in a, in a separate process, right? So with G, GDPR, this is something that we have to you know, be able to do, but we have a whole separate process for that. And so this isn't a portal goal, this is, you know, this is something that we have to update in our infrastructure scripts um, as a separate thing. Uh, another non-goal is allowing group sponsors to edit group metadata. So, um, you know, if, if, a, if a sponsor of a group, uh, if someone is a sponsor of a group, all they can do is add or remove users from the group. So they can't change the group name, they can't change the group description. That's something that happens pretty rarely anyway, and it's just not something that we care about being allowed to do from the portal. And then administrative actions. So um, 
for admins, for you know, people in the core infrastructure team um, who want to you know, change information about other users or whatever. Uh, this isn't really something that we are going to have in the portal to start. Um, if, if somebody absolutely needs to do that, they can use the uh, CL CLI tooling from FreeIPA um, on the command line and do that. Um, it's, it's just not a, a goal of the self-service portal. So, um, I'm going to talk about the self-service portal, the, the portal that we're developing now. Uh, it's called Securitas. And I'm going to hopefully give a, a quick demo of it. If the Wi-Fi is nice, live demos never fail, and nothing could possibly go wrong. So, um, some, this is all subject to change. This is kind of very experimental and just something that we're, we're working on right now. But, um, so this is Securitas. So um, there's a registration form. A user can obviously register for an account. I can log in if I have an account. And so uh, right now, it's the, the image there is just pulling from Gravatar. But all of this information over here is in LDAP. Um, it's just. Uh, I'll talk about how the login flow works, and we do some interesting stuff there. But all of this is coming from LDAP. This is the group list that I'm in, again, all coming from LDAP. I can uh, narrow in on a group and see who all is in that group. Hopefully, if the Wi-Fi is nice, live demos never fail. Uh, so I can see the sponsor of the group. I can see the, uh, the users that are in the group. I can find out more information about those users. Um, you can theoretically search for users and groups up here, although it's, that's finicky sometimes. It's something I need to figure out. Um, and I can edit my profile. I can update my information. And so th this is kind of a proof of concept portal that I, I developed over the course of a week or two, just when we were kind of first having these discussions about uh, looking at using free IPA, and um, you know, we knew we were going to need a self-service portal. So this is uh, something that I threw together, at least to start a discussion with the team uh, internally, and and you know, figure out what all do we need to do, and and does this get us close? Is this what we're looking for? So, again, total work in progress. A lot of it is going to change. Um, I want to talk specifically about the login flow. So we do some interesting things there. So when a user log is, logs in, the portal takes their login information, it passes it to the free IPA API. Uh, free IPA will validate their credentials, and it will, it will start a session. It will start a normal session. So it will send back a cookie with a response if, if authentication is successful. And if it's valid, the portal, the proof of concept that I just showed, will take that session uh, cookie, it will encrypt it, and then it will store it in the user's browser. The reason we do that is so that every request that hits the IPA API will happen on behalf of the user. So we're not using some you know, glorified admin user to, to update people's information or whatnot through the portal. Everything is acting on behalf of the user through the portal. So the, the portal is basically proxying uh, these, these requests on the user's behalf as them to free IPA. And so we do it this way because you know, we want to use the principle of, of, of least access, right? So we don't want to use an admin user for things that we don't need to use an admin user for. Um, we only use escalated glorified accounts when absolutely necessary. So for things like creating a new account, obviously you need to be an admin to do that, um, or at least have permissions to do that. Uh, resetting passwords, like an expired password, you, you need a permission to do that. And so even the escalated accounts, they're not true global admin accounts, right? So you can use the, the role-based access control in free IPA to say, you know, these specific permissions are what this escalated account needs to do. And another advantage of doing it this way is all the logging and auditing, like it, it correctly shows that it's be, that these actions are being done by the user, not some admin user for, uh, for the user. They're being done as the user themselves. 
So the technology stack of this portal, um, we're using Python and Flask. Uh, it's just because what the team working on this is familiar with. Um, kind of over the past couple of years, we've uh, in, in Fedora infrastructure, we've kind of settled on, on this stack for most of our custom apps. And so this is what we're using for the portal. Um, one thing we're trying to do is avoid using external databases if we can. Um, we're just trying to store things in LDAP because we're already using LDAP for most of the information. And so far we've been successful. And we're using something called Python Free IPA as the kind of proxy layer, the, the API client that the portal uses. Uh, this is a third party module it's written by the Open Node group uh, in Estonia. It's an open source uh, library. So uh, development is ongoing. Like I said, the proof of concept that I demoed uh, that took a week or two to do uh, was kind of a free time thing just to, just to get it done and, and show it to the team and say, you know, hey, is this, is this something like what we're looking for? Um, and now the team is adding features to it and tests and making it look pretty because I'm not a designer. I don't know if you know that, but um, you know, we, we have actual designers who are uh, making it look pretty. Uh, but we're definitely receptive to help, right? So this is an open source project. Um, you know, it's, it's something that everybody in Fedora is going to end up using uh, when we switch to it. And so I'm definitely receptive. You know, the whole team is receptive to help if anybody's interested. Uh, towards the end, I have information on, on how to find out what we're doing and get involved. Uh, so there's a couple other pieces to consider, right? So we already are using this custom uh, Fedora account system, uh, Fast2. So how do we actually do the migration from the old system to the new system? And um, one thing is passwords for a while now have already been being synced over. We have an IPA instance in production and we have a little bit of custom Fast code that when a user changes their password in Fast, it will also sync it over to free IPA. So the reason we do that is we can't, you know, even if we write a script to migrate all of FAST over to free IPA, passwords are hashed differently between FAST and free IPA. So we can't just sync over all the passwords in a once and done transaction. So we're doing it as the user changes their passwords. So, you know, it's kind of an incremental shift over to, the, to, to free IPA having passwords for the users. Uh, I did write a script to port over the rest of the user data as well, so uh, things like which groups they're in, um, you know, their name, other information, GPG keys, and so on. Um, so we do have that. Uh, we need to announce these changes and prepare people for them because it's going to be quite a change. Again, a lot of people rely on FAST right now. So announcing the changes, getting the word out um, once we get to that point is something that we will need to consider. Updating applications that currently rely on FAST, so a lot of applications uh, currently tie into the API that FAST provides, and we need to update those applications to tie into the new API. And then uh, this one is kind of uh, something that we're just starting to look at and is still kind of up in the air, but collaboration with the CentOS infrastructure. Um, and I don't have a whole lot to announce there yet, but there, there is some collaboration that we're looking at uh, going on. So uh, for the applications that rely on FAST, um, there is in the new system a read-only JSON API that should provide most of the information that those applications currently rely on the FAST API for. Um, and this is something that the, uh, the free IPA team helped us out a lot and, and wrote this thing for us. Um, and it basically, it provides a limited view of some of the public data in, in free IPA so that applications can call into it and, uh, and, and do simple checks. Like, is this, mem is this group, it, sorry, is this user a member of this particular group? Or, you know, I, I know this person's username. Uh, tell me more about them. Tell me their, their real name. Uh, there are things still up for discussion. So deployment strategy, how and when do we deploy not only initially, but going forward as we, as we make changes to the system. Again, the CentOS collaboration kind of still up in the air. Um, figuring out how Fedora specific things should be. So um, we, we want the greater 
open source community to be able to set up a similar system like this. Um, you know, I, I know for a fact that Fedora is not the only project that has these kinds of problems that, that we're trying to solve. So I think other communities could, could really make use of this. Um, so it's a matter of kind of abstracting out the Fedora specific stuff, like the schema changes and, and how much the self-service portal relies on those schema changes. Um, basically figuring out how to abstract that so that other communities can kind of use the same tool set and set up something similar. And then, of course, you know, everybody has features that they want within the community, and so figuring out uh, what all the community wants that we didn't think of and how to prioritize those and, and when to spend time implementing those things. Uh, a couple of acknowledgments. Of course, the free IPA team, they've been super, super helpful. They've added, uh, added features to IPA core. Um, when I first started looking at this project, it, there, there was no concept of group sponsors in free IPA. So you couldn't say, you know, you, you couldn't say the, these particular people are sponsors of the group and they can add, you know, they, they can add people to the group. Um, that was only something that core admins of free IPA could do. So that, that kind of delegation wasn't there originally. They've added that for us, which is awesome. Uh, they wrote the initial uh, custom schema for us, so adding fields that we need to, uh, to the LDAP schema that weren't there uh, out of the box. And again, they wrote the initial uh, read-only JSON API that the applications that we have are going to use, um, which is awesome, super helpful. Uh, Patrick, for those of you who don't know, uh, amazing knowledge of AAA and security processes. Um, he's the one that came up with the original idea for how the portal does that kind of handshake process that I talked about to exchange out the, the encrypted uh, uh, cookie and uh, session token. Uh, he wrote Ypsilon, uh, which we use for uh, OpenID Connect. And again, just his, his knowledge of AAA and his experience just in general has been super, super helpful. So definitely acknowledging him. And the original FAST contributors, like, you know, it has problems, but also it's gotten us this far. We've used this thing for like 13 years now. So yeah, it's had problems, but it got us to where we are. Uh, the open, open node cloud people, uh, because we're using their API library. So give a hand for these folks, especially if you, if you know these people. Uh, this project would not be possible without, without the work they've, they've done for us and are helping us to do. So uh, if any of this is interesting, if you want to follow along, uh, we have three, uh, three GitHub repositories right now. Um, the, the last one is not special. It's not supposed to be linked like the other one, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the portal, the self-service portal is uh, the first one, Securitas. Uh, Free IPA Fast is the schema extension, and then FastJSON is the, uh, the read-only API that I mentioned. Uh, we also have a, uh, uh, an IRC channel, uh, Fedora-AAA, and uh, the, the team of people working on this are, are all in there right now, uh, but feel free to drop in. We have meetings in there regularly, um, but also just feel free to drop in and ask questions or say, hey, I want to help, what can I do? Uh, or just idle there and follow along. We're more than happy to have you. We want to do all of this in the open. It's something that affects the entire Fedora community. Um, and hopefully other communities if, if they end up using our work. So we want this to be a very open and transparent thing, so we are more than, more than happy to have people kind of follow along and uh, ask questions. If, if something's unclear to, to somebody who's interested in this, then it's unclear to other people as well. So ask the obvious questions. Speaking of questions, does anyone have any? Yeah, so the, the one that the password sync is happening across right now is that, that same instance. And we are going to have to upgrade that instance because we need the group sponsorship stuff, which is in a newer IPA than we currently are using. Um, but yeah, it, it will be that same, that same uh, deployment. What do you see as your earliest and biggest challenge to 
Uh, he asked, what, um, what is the earliest and biggest challenge to combining uh, CentOS and, and Fedora's uh, authentication? Uh, there's still a lot up in the air right now. So that, that, that whole idea was only very recently approved by the CentOS board. Um, and so there's, there's a whole, whole lot of discussion and, and figuring out, you know, I would say right now just policy alone is something that's going to take a while to flesh out. Um, that's why I, I didn't want to hit on that too much in the, in the talk, just because there's, there's so much up in the air still. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something we're looking at. All right, so the, so the question is, how are we using uh, Keycloak and I guess OpenIDC in general uh, versus uh, IPA on the back end? So, um, so Keycloak, we, we don't actually use Keycloak right now. We use Ypsilon, which is another OpenIDC, OpenID Connect provider. Um, basically, everything is stored in IPA and will continue to be stored in IPA. And Ypsilon just acts as an OpenID Connect uh, provider. It, it connects into uh, IPA for doing the, the authentication, um, but it's, it's like a layer on top of it for web apps to use to authenticate. So we're, we're not actually storing information in Keycloak or Ypsilon. We're just kind of using that as a proxy layer to, to let web apps authenticate. Do you plan to switch to Keycloak? Uh, the question is, do we plan to switch to, key, to Keycloak? It's an open discussion. Uh, it's not going to be in the initial phase of the project, but it's something that we have to talk about doing later on. <coughs> All right. Well, thank you. I hope to see you around the uh, IRC channel. And yeah, thank you.